very good Monday evening to you from the KTN News Centre. It is the 10th day of November 2014. This is KTN Prime. Now, on the programme tonight, we revisit the Lamu Land Saga. There have been investigations ongoing for the last three months. And now the National Land Commission is cracking the whip. Let's stay with cracking the whip and Kenyans have been having a discussion on that expose that was done by John Alanamu and Mohamed Ali on uh, Pastor Kanyari and of course now the government says it wants to regulate the registration and operation of churches. The National Council of Churches of Kenya says it wants to be part of that. We'll have details of that story. We thank you for joining us on KTN Prime. I'm Linda Ogutu. And I'm Ben Kitili. These are the top stories tonight. 12 pieces of land sasa zinaonekana zilikuwa watu wamechukua tu bila kufuata sheria ile inawekwa 12 title deeds are revoked as investigations continue in the Lamu land saga Tumeweza kusikia manduru kule rift vale na wengi wetu hatukujua ni nini ilikuwa inaendelea deadly border row between Kakamega and Nandi also on KTN Prime, Mombasa police now link drug barons to terror groups. And Alcoblo is credited with the 11% reduction in road accidents. Many thanks for joining us on KTN Prime. Our sign language interpreter at the bottom end of your screen is Meresha Oweti. The National Land Commission has recommended the revocation of 12 title deeds in the county of Lamo. This follows a three-month-long investigation into the controversial 500,000-acre parcel of land. Now, its other titles are said to be regularized with only one title deed being upheld. Ketian's Betty Kialo begins our coverage tonight. <laughs> After weeks of investigations into the allocation of 500,000 acres of land in Lamu County, it has emerged that 12 of the controversial 22 parcels had irregularities. As a result, the National Land Commission has called for the revocation of those titles with immediate effect. The Commission has further advised that another eight parcels of land be regularized after it was established that the process of issuing the documents was irregular. Only one title deed has been upheld. Where the title is illegal, the law says that the Commission shall direct the registrar to revoke such titles. According to the officials, the 12 allocated parcels of land in Lamu had one or two other requirements that were missing or inappropriately entered, such as the list of directors, duration of the lease, and size of land. The 12 title deeds that have since been recommended to be revoked include Brick Investments Limited, Ruskin International Limited, Lamu and Tana Sugar Company Limited, Shanghai Investments Limited, Fincorp Investments Limited, Sheila Ranches Limited, Kairala Ranch, Cyberdome Investments, Carb Investments Limited, and Lamu Investments Limited. Those recommended for regularization include Dynamic Trading Limited, Savannah Fresh Fruits Limited, Witu Nyangoro Cooperative Society Ranch, Mokoe Kibokoni Ranch, Baragoni Boni Community Ranch, Pandanguo Boni Community Ranch, Amu Ranch Cooperative Society Limited, and Witu Livestock Cooperative Society Limited. The Commission recommended that the title for Marlin Ranching Company Limited be upheld as it was obtained legally. According to the report, the recommendations were based on the views and submissions of all interested parties that appeared in a judicial process. In July this year, President Uhuru Kenyatta called on the revocation of 22 title deeds belonging to certain companies and asked for immediate investigations. The commission has since advised that the affected parcels of land should be reverted back to Lamu County. Betty Kialo, KTN. The big Q in association. Important issues, and that story is the basis of a big question tonight. We are asking you will the revocation of title deeds help resolve the land issues at the cost? Let us know what you think. You can tweet us at KTN Kenya at Ben underscore Kitele at Linda Ogutu. We'd love to sample your views on that particular issue on KTN Prime. Will the revocation of the titles help to resolve land issues at the cost? Very emotive issue. Let us know. 
now take you to the county of Kakamega and police there are investigating the killing of one man that prompted clashes between the Nandi and Luya communities. Now several people were injured and four houses torched in the overnight attack. As Ketian's Ashamuelu with the details. A land dispute, two neighbors, and the reignition of a three-decade tussle between two communities. <laughs> when local resident Joel Kosge was killed in a row of our boundary, all hell broke loose. Kusavali, the border between Kakamega and Nandi counties, was turned into a battle zone. By dawn, many had opted to pack up and flee. Tumeweza kusikia. Manduru kule rift vale na wengi wetu hatukujua ni nini ilikuwa inaendelea jirani wetu wa luya wamepita mpaka mpaka wamepita nand escapement ndio hiyo msosote inatoke inatoke inatokesa mnandi mmoja ameweza kuwawa huko juu na muluya ambaye hatuwezi tukamjua as the murder suspects fled from the Nandi escarpment, whispers from curious villagers turned into fear of revenge attacks over the boundary dispute. Tulijua bila mtu amekufa, tulijua sasa wanataka sijui walia tuhame huko sijui hatu hatu kuelewa hapo shida iko wapi. Hii shamba vile imeua yeye, tunaomba serikali wangangane mambo ya mpaka na watuchore na watusuluhishie hii shida. It wasn't long until armed security officers took charge of the village as governors from the two counties moved in to contain the tension. The people who are there, the number of them who are involved, are to be arrested and brought to Nandi so that justice to be seen to be done. The lawyer escaped and the uh, uh, ran to western side. The two communities clashed over land in 1992, leading to the deaths of tens of people and the displacement of hundreds others. With memories of such past clashes still vivid to some residents here, this time they'll choose to move elsewhere until Kam returns to Kusavali. Ashamwilu, KTN. Let's now take you to the coastal side of the country. Police in Mombasa are holding five suspected drug barons who include two sons of the lead drug lord Ibrahim Akasha. Baktash Akasha, Ibrahim Akasha and two associates were arraigned in court this afternoon in connection with the seizure of 98 packets of heroin seized in Nairobi. KTN has learned that the United States of America has also requested for their extradition to face charges. And as Ferdinand Omondi now reports top security officials are warning that they are now moving in for the barons. Baktash Akasha, Ibrahim Akasha, Vijay Anangiri and Kulam Hussein were brought before Chief Magistrate Maxwell Gisheru. Police wanted them detained for a further 14 days pending investigations into a drug consignment intercepted in Nairobi. In a sworn affidavit, investigating officer Hamisi Masa revealed Kenya's anti-narcotics unit intercepted 98 packets of heroin in Nairobi last week on Friday the 7th in a joint operation with the Drug Enforcement Agency of the U.S. The affidavit stated that the suspects are liable to charges of conspiracy to traffic narcotic drugs into the United States of America. The consignment is believed to have been headed for the U.S. market. The quartet is believed to be part of a transnational organized crime syndicate operating between Kenya and the U.S. The U.S. government has now requested for the extradition of the four suspects to face charges of trafficking narcotic drugs. Baktash Akasha and Ibrahim Akasha are sons of the notorious drug lord Ibrahim Akasha, while the other two suspects, according to police, are of Indian nationality. We are dealing with now the drug barons. You will see, maybe in the next, uh, before a week ends, you will see the big names rolling. Baktash is pictured here with his late father who was shot dead on the streets of Amsterdam in the year 2000 in what police described as a drug deal gone sour. They were arrested on Monday in Akasha's Nyali home. 
The arrest of the Akashas has sparked some bold chest thumping from the state, which now says it is going after the proverbial big fish in the drug world. But in a country where some of the most prolific politicians and businessmen are linked to the drug trade, it will be interesting to see exactly how big the police can go. Ferdinand Mundi, KTN, Mombasa. The National Council of Churches of Kenya says it is not opposed to a move by the government to further regulate the registration and management of churches. The NCCK however, says it wants to have a say in the kind of regulations the government seeks to enforce. This follows an investigative piece by KTN on Jicho Pevo and the Inside Story exposing the activities of Pastor Victor Kanyari. <laughs> From coach testimonies to fake healing, the schemes of Pastor Victor Kanyari, which were exposed by KTN, generated overwhelming rage from Kenyans. And the government is seeking to ensure that churches do not steal in the name of God anymore. <laughs> Attorney General Gidu Moigai wants to review and amend the Societies Act, which governs the registration and management of churches, mosques, and temples. NCCK doesn't have a fundamental problem with that. But the National Council of Churches of Kenya, which has 44 member churches, wants to have a say in the proposed changes. The religious leaders put in their input in that process so that what is agreed is applicable widely. The NCCK also wants the government to cast its net wider in the regulation of religious institutions. Including mosques where radicalization happens. Aside from the regulation moved by the Attorney General, the Director of Public Prosecutions, Kiriako Tobiko, has asked the Director of Criminal Investigations to probe Kanyari over, among others, obtaining by false pretense, cheating and conspiracy to defraud. And where a religious leader is seen to operate outside the law, they should be held to account. <laughs> Pastor Victor Kanyari of the Salvation Healing Ministries, who coached people to offer false testimonies, faked healing and miracles, was exposed in Makria in Jili by Muhammad Ali on Jichopevu and prayer predators by John Alanamu on the inside story. Rita Tinina, KTN. And we're keeping an eye on that story for you. We'll let you know how that unfolds. Now, the National Transport and Safety Authority reports that the rate of fatalities on Kenyan roads has reduced by 11.7%. Uh, and as Mohamed Mahmoud now reports, this is attributed to the implementation of Alcoblo on the roads. Just to quickly run through some of the, the National Transport and Safety Authority has attributed the reduction of road carnage to the implementation of different legislations, including the recent night ban travel, speed cameras on highways, and use of alcohol blow. Driving at the recommended speeds. If the speed is 100, if the speed is 50, if the speed is 110, if you drive at the right speed with your safety belt. Even in instances, the unfortunate uh, occurs that is an accident, your chances of survival are much higher. The number of fatalities exists 3,000 every year. One of the survivors of the road accidents, Bright Oyuaya, has been on a wheelchair for more than 18 years. Na wale wanaumia na wengine permanently ni zaidi ya elfu kumi kila mwaka. With goodbye messages written on this piece of cloth, Bright always remembers those who perished in road accidents. There's a high probability that anyone can be involved in a road crash. Because you wake up in the morning like I did and I was okay. But by evening, I was in a different category. The, the statistics that are, that are said that tens of thousands of people are permanently injured. So far, reports of a reduction in road carnage is good news to her. She now calls for legislation to facilitate easy access to services for the physically challenged. The journey of acceptance from being an able person to a disabled takes a step at a time. But for Bright Oyuaya and other survivors, this has changed their lifestyle permanently. She is forced to use such ramps to access premises that are not built for wheelchairs. Mohammed Mahmoud. KTN in Westlands, Nairobi. 
Thank you, Mahmoud. Good news there. And now for some bad news. Kenyans have joined the rest of the world in mourning the death of American televangelist and motivational speaker, Dr. Miles Monroe. Monroe was in Kenya for a series of talks about three weeks ago, died alongside his wife and seven other people after his plane crashed while on his way to the Global Leadership Forum that was planned for the, no for the 10th to 13th of November. Wilson Boru has the details. It was news that shocked the world as details of a small plane crashing in the Bahamas began to emerge. The Bahamian Aviation Ministry first confirmed that there were some fatalities among the nine people on board the aircraft before police confirmed that motivational speaker Miles Monroe and his wife Ruth were among the nine people who had been killed in the crash. The ministry reported that the plane crashed while making an approach for landing at the Grand Bahama International Airport. According to authorities, the plane hit a crane, crashed and burst into flames, killing all passengers on board. The aircraft involved belonged to Dr. Miles Monroe, founder, president and senior pastor of Bahamas Faith Ministries International. Prior to his death, the 60-year-old had published more than 100 spiritual and inspirational works, with 49 of his books being bestsellers. Monroe often talked about his books understanding the purpose and power of a woman and the most important person on earth being some of his more popular titles among book readers in Kenya. Among his last interviews was his appearance on KTN's Jeff Koinange Live on October the 22nd. What's the difference between a job and a work? Well, your job is what they pay you to do. Your work is what you were born to do. Your job is your skill. Your work is your gift. Monroe often talked about death and how much he did not fear it and even challenged Kenyans to, quote, go to the cemetery and disappoint the graveyard, end of quote. And when you die, die like I'm planning to die, empty. It is finished. Kenyans took to social media to pay tribute to Dr. Monroe with the hashtag in memory of Monroe trending on Twitter. Gospel musician Kambua also tweeted, quote, another general and his wife gone, rest in peace, Miles Monroe, end of quote. I am not afraid of death anymore. I will see you again. Wilson Buru, KTN Prime. Big loss, I, might, I must say, for the entire world. Now, it's Monday. You know we have case files. And what would lead a man to eat the flesh and drink the blood of a fellow human being? Tonight on Case Files, KTN's Dennis Onsarigo returns to Naivasha, where he speaks to a self-confessed serial killer and also to his would-be victim, a woman who managed to escape, leaving behind the body of a victim buried under the bed. Here is a sneak preview of that. Kakuza akanitoa, alikuwa amenifunga mikono na miguu. Sasa so, akanitoa akanipeleka kwa bwawa. Kulikuwa na shimo hapo. Akaniambia this is your grave. <laughs> Sili kama ya mayai. Yenye tu naweza kula mayai. Ya. Yeah. Huge crowd followed the suspect wherever he led the investigators. The overwhelming stench of death from the house of torture. An aura as powerful as the reality residents of Kihoto in Naivasha have been at pains to come to terms with. The first vampire, Geoffrey Maderi, alias Fongo, has been charged with the murder of Miriam Wairimo, who died on August the 29th of 2008. The wounds were not even bleeding, so I didn't have even blood to bleed. Naomi Wanjiro, who survived the ordeal, appeared in court where she narrated how she met Maderi in Naivasha in September 2008. The Big Q. Case files coming right after this bulletin. Let's look at our big question. We're asking, will the revocation of titles help to resolve land issues at the coast? The view is coming in thick and fast. Conrad Ochego on Twitter says, no, it will not. Why would you issue title deeds like groundnuts then think of revoking them 
more problems. But Stephen Joy says yes, if only the land is redistributed equitably. Keep the SMSs coming. The number is 22155. Twitter at Linda Ogutu at Ben underscore Kitili and at KTN Kenya. and welcome to Job Center this evening and today we are all about the business of animation and 3D animation is popularly known as fast becoming a multi-million career or occupation for many young Kenyans and TV commercials, web animations, infomercials, uh, storyboarding, motion graphics, photography, web design, radio commercials, media buying, social media activation and app development are some of the works that are associated with animation and digital artists and because of them Kenyan television screen animated advertisements are fast becoming the preferred and cheaper option on Job Center. Tonight we host digital artist Mike Mudiga who is the creative director at Fatboy Animations commonly referred to as an animator and the name behind almost all the animated ads on today's television screens but um, I don't know if we have that clip uh, of some of the works that he has done you know regarding his career some of them uh, are actually up here so just take a look at some of the works of the third uh, person on Forbes top under 30 most promising entrepreneurs in Africa <laughs> Mike Mudiga has taken the business of animation to another level. <laughs> to this... Oh yes, Mambo, uh, how's everything at home? How's my boy Junior? Your son is doing good. How's work going? Sio mbaya, kazi hapa, kazi pale, Monday mood swings pale nyuma. And this. Mimi naitwa Bogwa, na hapa ni Bogwa Enterprise. Tunauza ngobe, kuku, gruwe, kwero, bata, thamaki, spare part, airtime, motura, joko karaga, pale niko na kabushari, dispensary, moshari, library, hardware na ka supermarket. Pale napo niko na garage, kiosk, photocopy na ka cyber cafe. Business is very efficient. But Bogwa. Eh, yeah. lori imeisha mafuta. Weka giri moja. Hii itanifikisha yeah. tu. Sitaweza kurudi. Wewe dongo, unataka kunimaliza? Kwenda nikupanda mlima. Ukirudi weka gari free. Taramuka na gravity. So some of those, those are some of the funniest, uh, you know, clips that I could come across online. And you can agree with me that that latest one seems to be the funniest of all. But anyway, away from that, you were named the third uh, on Forbes, top, under, uh, top 30 under 30 most promising entrepreneurs. How does that make you feel? And also the fact that you are just young. Did you learn this in college or university uh, or you were just home, home taught? Um. <coughs> Well, uh, on the Forbes uh, case, uh, I, I was actually actually surprised to to find myself listed as one of the most promising. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know that uh, well that was going to happen. So I was very uh, surprised and also very encouraged. I felt more motivated to keep doing what I'm doing. So it made me feel like I'm actually uh, going on the right. I'm on the right track. I'm doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, Animation is something I loved and uh, I enjoyed doing as a hobby and uh, um, just for fun. Any time, uh, even when I was stressed, I'd just get down to animation and or learn something new in animation. And this was, how old were you then? I was, I was very young. Um, uh, I'd, I'd say since I was a kid, probably in class one or two, because a lot goes into animation, even just drawing. So drawing still was... Uh, preparing me for where I am today mm -hmm. and I'd, uh, I'd really what I do is get into something artistic a, right. a lot of art things and uh, with time uh, I developed this into a career and uh, because it's something that I enjoy doing uh, I think that's why my business is also successful 
Right. Okay. Um, you are slowly, of course, making some people lose business in this industry of entertainment and TV. Uh, I'll give an example of models, uh, you know, the TV, editorial print and television models or video motion models. And, uh, you know, your business, that is uh, the business of animation, is growing very fast. Um, do you have a specific way in which you market this business? Um, right now, at the stage it's in, it markets itself. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I strive to make the best of uh, any project that I'm working on because at the end of the day, as long as it goes on screen, it, it's marketing me. So and it's self-marketing. It, it's self-marketed. Right. And what is the target lately or today for the animated, for your animated work? Who exactly do you target? Well, um, I'm, I'm targeting all corporates, mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, uh, none in part. There's no specific one, but all of them in general. Um, of course, avoiding a conflict of interest mm -hmm. in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, and even uh, moving away from just corporates, uh, government institutions, and uh, uh, NGOs as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. And what is your biggest competition at the moment? Do you have competitors in this uh, one? Because it seems unique. Biggest competition? Um, I'd say the competition would come when it comes to, to costs. Um, Others would uh, um, probably charge much less than I do, mm -hmm. but uh, quality-wise and uh, the kind of content we produce, uh, I don't think there's that competition I've seen. Mm -hmm. All but right, yeah. there's no competition, so you are just enjoying it, enjoying Monopoly. So um, I would also like to find out from you, how rewarding is the business of animation? Um, financially, it's rewarding. Um, uh, peace of mind as well because I wake up every day and uh, excited to go to work and, and do something that I enjoy. Uh, it's also opened uh, very many doors for me also to meet uh, other people and uh, also networking a lot and uh, gotten a lot of people interested in what I do. Mm -hmm. So that becomes very fulfilling. Right. Are there any challenges whatsoever in this business? Um, yes. Uh, there's a couple of challenges. Uh, at times, it's, uh, deadlines become a very mm -hmm. huge challenge because uh, animation is a very, uh, uh, it takes a lot of work to do and a lot of time to, to do so. At times, we are pressured into actually squeezing it into very little time. And uh, we have to find a way around it. Right. Maybe probably sleepless nights or no weekends. Or what holidays. is the toughest part about it? Is it the rendering of the material that you've come up with? Uh, what exactly is it? Um, at, at times, it's uh, rendering can uh, at, at times uh, uh, create some, one of the biggest problems in the process mm -hmm. because uh, uh, sometimes if there's just one small error in the in the scene, the the render farm won't it it won't render the, the animation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So finding the problem in in, in what you've created mm -hmm. becomes a, a task and is what beats down on the deadline. All right. Yeah. Are there? Uh, any pieces of advice that you'd like to pass on to the younger Kenyans who are getting into what you're doing? And of course, uh, those of them who are aspiring to become digital artists, what would you like to tell them? Um, right now, the market is uh, it's big. Uh, and even just for the few uh, people that are doing it right now, mm -hmm. um, it's big and it's going to get much bigger. And, and when there's demand for content and animated uh, content, the, the the workforce will be required a lot of it so it's for those that uh, have a passion for this and are geared towards this they should continue and put more effort into it be self-driven and uh, the, not necessarily have someone there to watch them or make them work or do something mm -hmm. yeah all right and uh, thank you so much for joining us in this edition of job center wish you all the best and of course enjoy the monopoly while it lasts and that is Job Center for tonight. We were speaking about the business of animation where it is a unique uh, business in, or a unique market uh, that people are looking at. And of course, it's taking over quite a huge number of Kenyans because it lasts uh, on the mind. But well, thank you so much for watching this edition of Job Center. My name is Joy Darin Bira. Up next is KTN Business.
watching KTN Prime. Good evening and welcome to Business. Regional integration continues to be the way to go for most countries in Africa. Kenya seems to be leading the pack in East Africa and tonight our latest entrant KTN's Abi Agina spoke to Cabinet Secretary Tourism, Commerce and East African Affairs, Phil Scandia together with East Africa Business Council member Kelly Kiluto to get um, their latest perspective of the gains being made and areas that are still lagging behind in regional integration. What are some of the highlights that you can speak of that you have realized since you came into office? A lot has happened um, over, the, over, 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 over the year. Um, across the board, um, you are talking about, you know, um, implementation of, um, you know, policies, the ESC um, uh, visa. Um, and three countries have implemented that protocol, that is Uganda, uh, Rwanda, and Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, within it also, it was agreed that we would use the national ID to uh, cross the borders. So that has really helped in the movement of, 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 of people across, across the border. The other one that we have done also is um, we have ensured that um, the one-stop shop, uh, the one-stop border post, mm -hmm. um, two are already working. Uh, one is... Uh, Taveta Lunga Lunga um, border post, yeah. which is working. And then the other one is um, at the border of uh, Rwanda and Uganda. I'm speaking from a business community perspective, has there been an impact along these lines where we're seeing um, more traders crossing borders using national IDs uh, instead of the passport? Yes, uh, exactly. There are quite a lot of people moving uh, across, particularly where the Three partner states have agreed that uh, people can move with their own national identities. Therefore, you are seeing an increase in uh, the movement of people and also of uh, goods. Uh, but more important, uh, perhaps you reduce the cost of uh, uh, the telephone. Right? You have roaming costs are removed. Mm -hmm. Then you can imagine what that means in the cost of doing business. Uh, at the same time, air travel. Because, yes, roaming costs go down, but if the cost of air travel from one partner state to the other doubles, yeah. uh, for example, if uh, all over it's about an hour, whatever you travel in East Africa is one hour. Mm -hmm. Now, the cost of air travel is as, as though you are flying five hours to Dubai. What should you expect moving forward, tangible solutions for traders, for businessmen across the region? What? I would like to um, tell the business community and also Wanainchi in general is that you, there, there are opportunities within East Africa. Don't confine yourself to just trade within Kenya. Well, that's all we had for you today. Do join us next week, same time. Thanks, Abby. And milk processor Brookside has inked a deal with Commercial Bank of Africa and car and general. Uh, parts as it steps up its milk uh, collection operation around the country. The deal will see potential milk collectors get a full 30,000 shillings loan from CBA to buy specially fabricated tuk-tuk trucks to collect milk. Brookside is targeting dairy production groups with the facility with the hope of cutting down losses as the trucks have an ability to access narrow feeder roads and at a fuel consumption rate of one liter for 36 kilometers. Last year, Brookside paid 270 million shillings to farmers in Nyeri County for raw milk deliveries, reflecting 10% growth over the previous year. It should be about 500 kilos. And the beauty about this tuk-tuk is that it's able to carry even small amounts of milk, unlike now the other vehicles that we normally hire. And it's also very economical in terms of fuel consumption.
maize farmers from the North Rift region are calling on the government to increase the supplement, supplementary budget allocation to the National Cereals and Produce Board to enable it buy enough stocks of maize from farmers. This comes even as the farmers continue to raise a red flag of a plummeting of prices where a 90 kilogram bag of maize has dropped from an average of 3,200 shillings to May in as low as 1,300 shillings. KTN's Charles Kitonga has the details. Maize farmers across the country are unhappy with the government's failure to come up with adequate measures to stabilize prices. Over the last six months, the price of a 90 kilogram bag has plummeted by about 60 percent, resulting into major losses to the farmers. Those from the North Rift region, the country's largest maize producer, are now calling for a larger supplementary budget to enable the National Series and Produce Board to wipe out surplus stocks from the area. The 2.7 billion shillings allocated by the government, they say, is barely enough since there is higher production this season. Currently, the allocated amount of 2.7 billion, if, it's go, if they are going to buy maize at 3,000 a bag, 90 kg bag, that is going to buy less than a million bags. Western Geshu County alone is expected to produce 3.8 million bags of maize this season. And in absence of a better supplementary budget, farmers are worried of wastage and losses. Well, the combined total of maize that is likely to be available now, if the cereals board were to open the stores, uh, are enough to just wipe out that 2.7 billion shillings within three weeks. The farmers are also unsatisfied with the recent restructuring of the series board, saying their interests were sidelined. Charles Gitonga, KTN. It had become the hottest drama in the business sphere, Britain's war against a group of former employees and a company in which it has a minority stake. Now, Akon just says Britain is smarting after losing the 40 billion shilling real estate pipeline. However, Britain says it has lost billions from the two and it wants it back. KTN's Adelaide Changole brings us the latest from the unfolding fiasco. The country has been treated to a spectacle over the last two weeks after Britain decided to take on a group of ex-employees that made away with Akon's 40 billion shilling real estate pipeline deal. Britain has filed a court case against the former executives who left two months ago to form Seton, accusing them of defrauding the farm of 3.9 billion shillings and using accounts managed by Acorn to swindle the funds. But according to court documents filed by Acorn in response to Britain's suit, Acorn says the lawsuits are the result of a failed attempt to increase their shareholding in the real estate developer from the current minority stake of 25% to a majority stake. Acon has also rubbished Britain's accusation that the four executives in question defrauded the farm. According to court documents, Acon says there is no way that the Britain asset management team could transfer the 3.9 billion shillings without the full knowledge of Britain executives and top owners. Meanwhile, details coming to KTN intimate that three of the four Seton executives were arrested on Friday and held for questioning before being released on bail early Saturday morning. The High Court has barred Acorn and Seton from transferring any of the funds or developing any of the 10 real estate projects pending a hearing slated for Wednesday. Adelaide Changole, KTN Business. Financial Report, brought to you by KCB Home Loans. We got 105% mortgage from KCB. It covered all our costs. Deposit, legal fees, duty, everything. We've seen an apartment, but go to KCB. And that's all that we had for you tonight in KTN Business. Lynn Washira is up next with KTN Sports. Thank you for staying with us here on KTN Prime. Very quickly on the big question. Now, the National Land Commission has recommended the revocation of 12 title deeds in the county of Lamu. We had asked you on the big question, will the revocation of title deeds help to resolve land issues 
at the cost. What is the poll result, Linda? 75% of you say no, 25% of you say yes. The poll results there on your screen on our big question tonight. Dr. We'll Makori says no titles are revoked during the day and reallocated at night. Else, let them name the revoked titles. Atim Odianga says the engagement of inhabitants in the, in the problem is a cornerstone of peace and hence mutual imperative. Makweni Senator Mutula Kilonzo Jr. says no, there must be thorough investigations, due process and findings made public. And Liat Conrad Ochego says um, objectively engaging residents of the coast to deal with the land problems will yield lasting solutions. Thank you for your views. On behalf of Marisha Oweti at the bottom end of your screen, thank you for watching KTN Prime. Have a good night. I'm Linda. A good to we'll see you tomorrow. Many thanks for joining us on the program tonight. I'm Ben Kitili. Have a wonderful night. Remember, Case Files with Dennis Onsarigo begins shortly.